Hi, welcome to the L Rush Show, where I deliver content intended to inspire, educate, and motivate. Engage with me online at lrush.com and on social media. Enjoy the show. Today, my guest is Mark Lichance. He's the author of The Lucky Formula, How to Stack the Odds in Your Favor and Cash In on Success. He is a serial entrepreneur, strategic thinker, and investor. He possesses a deep understanding of blitz scaling companies, and he is currently the CEO and lead investor of Maxi Media, one of the largest TikTok, Facebook, Snapchat, and Google Display Network performance marketing agencies in the world. Currently, Maxi Media is the number one advertiser in terms of monthly spend on the TikTok platform in Canada and top 10 in North America. You can connect more with Mark at theluckyformula.com. Hey, Mark, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Elle. So the lucky formula, you know, this book, how to stack the odds in your favor and cash in on success, but your humble beginnings, you didn't feel so lucky at one point. Let's talk about where you started. <laughs> well, uh, my father or my family comes from the construction background. Actually, if you go way back there, they're farmers from Eastern Quebec. So, um, you know, when they moved here in, in the sixties, they all got into construction they all took the jobs that they could, but the key, you know, the key learnings I got from my childhood is that, you know, every one of them, they moved to the ghetto when they first got here, but none of them stayed there and none of them took a handout and none of them, you know, asked anybody for anything. They worked their way out and, and everybody, all the eight kids are very successful today. And uh, it's, it's the work ethic that, you know, the family has from, from the farming background. And, uh, you know, from there, I then, you know, had to work for my father uh, to pay for university. He had a, uh, he had a real estate, uh, let's say blow up in the eighties, like a lot of people did. If you remember 87, oh, I don't know. I don't know how old you are. I don't think you do. You're too, uh, too young for that. No, I'm, I, unfortunately, <laughs> I am old enough. I think, so. <laughs> oh, the, and if you remember 87, there was a uh, the stock market crash and a lot of yes. real estate deals went upside down. So my father did as well. And I had to go work for him uh, pretty much full time all, all summer long and every break and every holiday to pay for college, actually. So, uh, you know, I learned, uh, pretty, <laughs> the hard way that, uh, construction is a tough job and, and I don't, I don't want to, I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. So that's kind of, you know, where I get my, uh, I guess my work ethic and my, uh, desire to not do things I don't want to do <laughs> from construction days. When you talked about what a lot of people have, which is, uh, I heard you say that you, you know, you'd like wake up and it was like looking out the window and knowing you'd have to spend all day on a hot roof. And you're just like, Oh shit. Yeah, the worst. The worst. So, you know, in the book, it talks about, you know, 20, uh, 20 conditions on, on, you know, getting to the next level. And one of them is your why. Like everybody has to have a why, L. I'm sure you have a why, which I'll ask you after I tell this little story. But uh, so one of my whys is, you know, never, ever having to look out that window and see that hot blazing sun come up over the horizon and know I have to be on that roof. Because I, I don't know, L, if you've ever done hard labor, which I'll call it. But, uh, you know, rubber roofs uh, in 100 degree weather is not fun. Mm. <laughs> it sucks, actually. So anyway, what's your why, Al? Uh, why what I do what I do or why I pursue That's what right. I do? Why your pursue? You know, I would say that um, what's been valuable to me in my life, so all the different things that I have done or still do, so... Um, I would say is to make people feel better. So whether that's I'm helping someone with a thyroid problem or I made someone laugh because I used to do sketch comedy, I just want to bring joy and laughter to people because I know how much that has enriched my life from others who brought it to me. Oh, very cool. Awesome. I love it. Is that good enough or do I that's need great. to? <laughs> you, you nailed it. You nailed it. <laughs> So let's, so, so let's get into this. I mean, so, so you're in this like hard labor thing. Did you ever think, oh, um, did you think at that point, like, oh man, this is just going to be my life. I'm be doing construction forever. Did you think, oh, well, I'll get off the roof and then into the office and I can work in construction that way. Like, did you see a path within that industry and thinking maybe, oh shit, I'm locked into it. Like, what were your thoughts at that time about getting out of it? No, I knew, look, I knew I wasn't stuck into it. I knew, you know, with work ethic and with uh, sales skills or the ability to, you know, and it, the non-fear to talk to anybody, which, which I have and had and got it from, from my uh, parents. Uh, I knew that I wouldn't stay in construction, but um, you know, it was, so when I, grad, so I'll, I'll actually tell you a story around that. So when I graduated uh, college in 1992, a few years ago, <laughs> um, the, the market again was not good. And most of my friends were, were 
in Boston and most of the guys I graduated with were, were going to work for Staples at like, I, I think the, the starting wage was $24,000 a year. Mm. And I, in my head, I'm like, there's no chance I'm going to work for 24,000. I'm going to go back in the, on a construction crew and I'm making 40,000. So almost double everybody I knew, but I, I knew it wouldn't be a long-term play. There's no chance I want to do that long-term. Um, and I also knew that, uh, you know, my brother at the time was being recruited by every university in every, you know, big time, uh, hockey university in, in the States. And he was getting scouted by every national hockey league team. And also he was getting recruited by every agent in the world, every top agent. And then I had met a few of them and I said, you know what, this is what I want to do. So that's kind of why I went back to working in construction so I can put stack money away to start my own agency, which, which I did, which was uh, pretty phenomenal for a few years. So I didn't stay in construction. I got out and I got into the uh, sports agent business, which was a lot of fun. So you did what a lot of people think is impossible. You were like, I will stay here and stack away money to do the thing I want to do that's going to require money. So again, just shows that you can do some planning while you're in a job you don't like, that's not your passion to try to go for the one that you, that you want. Now, when you started this agency, like how'd that go? Cause you are a serial entrepreneur. So I do want to hear about some of the, you know, I know there's some ups and downs. I know there's lots of failures you learned from, but um, tell us about the agency. Well, look, it was a lot of fun. I mean, imagine, and, and so I'll, I'll go back. So I have two brothers that played professional hockey, right? So one played in the NHL for 13 years and another one played professionally for 10 years in Europe. Um, do and they have all people, their teeth? Just kidding. <laughs> they do actually have all their teeth. <laughs> they do. They never, but here's a funny story around that. So the first shift, my little brother stepped on the ice in professional hockey. He got a slap shot right between the eyes. Mm. So if it, let's say we were three inches lower, his, his whole mouth would be gone. But, <laughs> but he had, uh, I think he had something like 50 stitches on his first shift ever. His first you know, time he stepped on the ice professionally. Oh, <laughs> so, and then you got to get it back on the ice after that. Brutal. Well, in those days, he had a coach by the name of Jimmy Roberts, who was old school. So my brother went back into the locker room, got stitched up and put a half shield on. And Jimmy, you know, oh, yelled at like him. Rocky. Like exactly. What? But he's like, take that half shield off. <laughs> anyway, it was, it, was, it was a bit crazy back then. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so, uh, yeah. Getting into the sports agent business, look, it was a lot of fun. I mean, you're hanging around with professional athletes. You're traveling the world. So I was all over Canada. I was all over the United States. I was all over Europe, the Czech Republic, Sweden, uh, namely. So I was able to, to, you know, I would go to Sweden every summer for, for two weeks. And, you know, Sweden's a hotbed for hockey players. So that was a ton of fun. I uh, met a lot of great people. And, uh, but, you know, over the course of eight years, it got really redundant and tired because traveling, I don't know, El, if you've traveled your whole life, but uh, after a while, it really gets, it really grinds on you. No, you just and want it, to be home. Ex- to exactly. Be home. Yeah. Well, especially you, you want to be home. You're in Malibu. I would want to be home too, right? <laughs> That's right. I live in a vacation. I don't need to go anywhere. <laughs> That's what I say too. <laughs> so uh, now, now this is what I'm hearing too. And this is where I can see someone in, in the audience going, oh, well, that's not fair because I would be willing to assume that the reason you were able to be so successful initially and get even anyone on your side as being an agent is because you were connected already to people that were in it. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm just saying, all right, well, the odds were already stacked in your favor, man. How are, how am I going to stack them in mine if I don't have brothers and family members who are playing in, you know, hockey leagues? I I could answer that pretty easily because there are plenty of other brothers and sisters out there that never took the route that I took, right? Plenty. So, you know, you, you have to take everything you have in your favor and stack it. And also it's, it's called work ethic. It's called learning. It's called, you know, uh, putting in, putting in the time. So you look, I know thousands, if not thousands, I know many, many, many people that came from humble backgrounds, came from nothing, didn't have connections that made it out of nowhere. So uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I, I don't think it, yes, the connections gave me a hand, but I think I would have made it anyway, because I loved the game. I loved you know, business. I love talking to people. So it just, look, there, there's another book, uh, uh, by the name of what it's another lucky book. What's the name? Uh, I'll look it up after, but, uh, by Richard Wiseman. So the luck factor, sorry. So luck always in, intends to come to people who, who speak to other people who aren't afraid to ask questions, who aren't afraid to, you know, open doors verbally. So that's, that's what I have. I have that Absolutely. skill set. 
And so if you have that skill set, look, you're going to be successful. Yeah. And you can develop that, which is, you know, part of what I do to teach people self-esteem and confidence to be able to speak up and go ask for what they want. You're never going to, you have to make these calls. Even if you're not in sales, you're selling yourself, right? So you got uh, burnt out on the travel with being a uh, sports agent. And then where'd you go from there? How did you discover what it was that you were going to do next? Well, it wasn't only the travel. It was the fact that, so I had at the height of my career, I had an uh, agent career. I had seven guys in the National Hockey League, seven players. And then I had 35 players in the, in the minor leagues, like the American Hockey League and the International League. And I was fired by two of them in one year. So I lost, you know, if I can do the math quickly, something like 30% of my revenue in, in, you know, in the course of a year. And, you know, I was actually flabbergasted that I lost these two clients because I'd done everything for them, literally wiping their backside, if you understand what I mean, Mm -hmm. like I used to do to my kids. So it was, you know, I quickly saw that, look, this is glorified babysitting. This is, you know, this is insane. This guy, I lent his brother money. I, you know, did this, did that, picked up his father here, blah, 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 did everything for, for these people. And then, so I get fired. So I'm like, you know what? This is, this is crazy. This is not recurring revenue. And simultaneously, I met somebody in the payments business. And this guy was making at the time, which was great money, $20,000 a month, driving a Porsche, living life. And he had 2,000 clients, not seven, right? So if he got fired by one, two, three, ten 10 of them, it didn't really matter. It wouldn't really affect his, his revenue. And I saw that it was recurring. So if he wanted to take you know a couple of weeks off, all the time, like a couple of weeks off a month, he could because the, the, the money is recurring. And that's how I, I fell into the, uh, to the payments business. I learned a valuable lesson about recurring revenue. And now obviously that brings me into to real estate. Now that brings me into uh, yield farming, crypto that brings me into payment portfolios and other portfolios that pay recurring revenue. So that, that's kind of how I got out of the agent business. I was fired uh, you know, by two clients, lost a, a significant percentage of my revenue. I said, you know what? There's a better way out there for sure. So, yeah. So now, I mean, you are the, currently the CEO and lead investor of Maxi Media, right? They are the largest performance marketing agency in the world on TikTok, Facebook, Snapchat, the whole thing. So I'm assuming once taking your company public for the VersaPay solutions provider world you were in, you were able to go, okay, so why did you decide to move into this next? What was the passion or spark of interest there? Well, I had, so from payments, so I had four successful exits in the payment space. And and I saw kind of back in 2013, I saw the industry peak and I said, look, it's time to get out because margins were compressing big time. So I was able to engineer uh, the sale of my, the company I launched in 2009, I was able to sell it in 2016 to finally exit. And I, you know, that, that's a whole nother story of, of being a minority shareholder and trying to sell a, a, you know, a stake in a company where you're the minority. But anyway, that's another conversation. So anyway, I got, I was able to get out of, of the payment space. I, I felt that it was in, you know, going to peak, especially in the business we were in. We didn't have any special technology or any special, you know, anything that would get us to the next level. And I thought we were just a me too. So it was time, it was time to exit and uh, kind of fell into the digital marketing space. Like I do a lot of, <laughs> of my other ventures and uh, it's been tremendously successful. We we've grown from last year to this year by, you know, something like 400%. So it's uh, been a phenomenal year. Let's talk about some of the ways we can stack our odds in our stack the odds in our favor. Um, and I first would like to hear just some off the cuff remarks and thoughts about things you've seen and learn over all of these companies, no matter what industry it is in some fails that you were like, ah, not going to do that. That was bad, whether it was someone else or yourself. Like, even if it's something simple, like for example, when I was in the corporate world, I would make this suggestion to anyone who's working in that kind of environment. Don't ever be late, be early, show up to the office, get there before everyone else, like be that person. Um, that's a very simple one, right? Everyone would say, yeah, be on time, but you know what I mean? Sometimes I feel like you got to make the extra effort. So there's ways you can show up and show that you're proactive and loyal and you're on it. What are some of the things you've seen, some fails or some advice for people in business? Well, I'm going to give you a very simple one. So I hurt my shoulder uh, last month and I was, I was lying down on the, uh, on the physiotherapy uh, table and he's working on me. So we're having a good chat about whatever, whatever we're chatting about. I think we're chatting maybe about cryptocurrency or something about like that. And then a woman walks in, he's like, I'll, I'll call her Kathy for lack of a better word. Uh, I don't know her name, but anyway, so Kathy walks in 
And uh, the therapist says, hey, how you doing? And she her, immediately says, terrible. This hurts. That hurts. My day is horrible. So, mm-hmm. so my, my first lesson or my first, I guess, uh, tip is your language is everything. And your language creates your energy and your energy creates your luck, if you will. And it creates your surrounding and it creates your aura. So if your language is negative, if your thoughts are negative, then you can better, you can darn well guess that your day is going to be negative. So I guess one of the tips is, you know, obviously audit the language that's going through your brain, your thoughts, and then the language that's coming out of your mouth. So when I wake up in the morning, I I do affirmations. I have uh, my visualizations. I have, you know, uh, things I tell myself, like how great I am and how awesome I am and how happy I am and how, you know, grateful I am and how blessed I am. And, uh, and, and then I visualize what I want in the future. And, and often, Elle, I'm sure you, you do visualization. I'm pretty sure you do. Yeah, no, absolutely. 100%. So, you know, if you get, you get out of the gate the right way, chances are your day is going to go your way. And, you know, you know, language is one of them. And, uh, and I could tell you, you know, I could give you a thousand things right now to do, but uh, we'll start with language. Yeah. And, you know, uh, good point. No one wants to hear the complainer water cooler talker at the office. No one needs that. Don't bring your shit into the office. I remember... Uh, in the corporate world, we had a prima donna saleswoman who made a lot of money and thought she could get away with treating people a certain way because of what mm-hmm. she was bringing in for the company until one day, you know, everyone complains. And finally, they're like, we don't care how much money you're making. You're so much of a problem. You're out. But I remember she like walked into the office and like threw a water bottle across the hallway and was like, shit, fuck, or whatever it was. <laughs> and I asked her what happened. She's like, she crashed her. Porsche on the way into work or whatever it is. And I was like, you know what? I just went off. I was like, you have no fucking right to come in here and take your shit. I don't, I don't care if you crashed your Porsche. I don't care what you did. You're just rolling into this office and that's the energy you, you put in here. So that's the most extreme example. And then I would say, and I, I'm, I'm assuming you would agree with me on this. I admire, there was a guy named Paul who I used to work with and I admired him so much because what I saw was that people would come to him, let's say, and they might complain about a fellow coworker and he never engaged he always just listened and was like, sorry to hear that. I hope you guys work it out. He didn't Love get it. involved. And therefore he became the most likable person in the office. Mm-hmm. Because even though when you're talking and you're trying to talk shit to someone and they're not engaging, you kind of want them to, and you may be disappointed afterwards that they didn't give you that, you end up respecting them more. Absolutely. I, lo- I love that analogy. That's a great analogy. But, and you know what, early on in my career, I would engage in stuff like that. And I would actually, you know, take part in the conversation, which is, which is right. a mistake, like you said, and it just brings you down the wrong path and it makes you say the wrong things because <laughs> Elle, you know, this, if you say something, whatever you say is getting out and it's being twisted and it's being twisted the wrong way. So, yep. you know, the language, if it's not positive, or you have nothing good to say, don't say it. That, yeah, that's one of the things I can tell you. Remain neutral in the work environment. It's hard. Even if you agree that what Jenny did to Paul was shitty, just say, sorry to hear about that, man. I hope you guys work it out. Or it doesn't seem like her, but I'm, I'm sorry to hear you feel that happened or whatever it is, just stay out of it. Cause then you're just going to be getting, and, and again, you'll end up being probably the one that everyone comes to and looks up to and trusts because they know that you're not doing it elsewhere, even perhaps about them. Absolutely. Amazing so from, analogy. Yeah. So aside from uh, language, what else can we think about? Okay. We can think about, um, you know, the thoughts we spoke about, we can think about your why, which you spoke about gratitude. Are you grateful for everything you have? Are you showing gratitude? And, and when you're showing gratitude, good things typically happen to you, right? So, uh, and then, and then, okay, outside of that is, let's say you're in the office, how's your physiology? How's your, your body language? Mm. I keep on talking about language, but are you sitting at your desk slumped over? You know, are, are you having power calls? Are you sitting, like right now I'm sitting straight up and uh, I have a big smile on my face. Elle, I don't know if you could tell, but I do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so physiology, I think is everything. And it brings, you know, gets you mentally prepared for, for whatever task you have at hand. Um, you know, here's another one is, is acknowledgement. Are you acknowledging to yourself the great things that you've done in the past? Let's say you're going through a bad time right now. There are times that you had that were good. There are things that you've done in your life, like you won the spelling bee when you were a kid, or you, you know, you won the judo tournament, or you won whatever. There are things that, you know, you've gone through that are positive. So reflect on those. Don't reflect on the the BS that's going on in your life right now. And here's another thing: did you did you train this morning? Like I trained this morning, and when I train in the morning, it gets me 
you know, fired up, gets my endorphins flowing. It gets me excited for the day. So, or did you, did you sit at your desk? Did you have that muffin that has about a thousand, you know, a thousand calories and it has, you know, maybe 5,000 grams of sugar or 50 grams of sugar. And did you drink a coffee loaded with sugar? What do you think right. that's going to do to you? Well, you'll be asleep by 1030, right? So you'll be falling asleep at the desk. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that is obviously a part of my work. And I agree with you in what you have to say about that health and taking care of oneself, aside from just brain energy and function and energy all day long, it really does increase your confidence and self-esteem to feel good in your body. It doesn't mean you have to look like a shape model. No one's saying you got to be on the cover of GQ. It's just about feeling good about who you are in your body. But most of that is really stamina and brain energy. How can you be successful and handle all of these things when uh, you know your brain's not at optimal capacity? So I agree with that. Got to adopt exercise or a better diet, especially if you want to be very successful. Absolutely. And I remember, you know, back in, it was about 2000. So when, it, when we started Pivotal Payments, I used to go to lunch with the CEO and every lunch was a massive lunch and we'd have dessert after. And I would literally get back to my desk and crash. Mm-hmm. So, so the afternoon was almost a write-off because I, I, I wanted to, and sometimes I actually went, went, took a nap on the couch in my office. So, you know, that's no longer, I mean, I used to have energy afternoon energy, two on 10, two being you know, terrible and 10 being the best. And now I'm 10 on 10 all day long. So nutrition, fitness, you know, thought process, all that it it combines to, you know, to have an amazing lucky day. What do you, uh, I'm sure that you've had to, in your life, reach out and cold call tons of people for a variety of things. And, you know, it takes some, some gumption to do that. It takes self-esteem and confidence. There's a lot of people who have great ideas. Maybe they're even great managers and can run a great business and know how to do the back end, but they're not good at being the front person or selling themselves. This is a world where no one's going to come to your door and ask you what you got. You've got to go out there and put it. So let's talk about confidence and putting yourself out there. So many people are fearful. I would say it goes back to kind of what we touched on earlier, which is like, it never hurts to ask. That's the story of my life. I can't I can't even, it happened to me not too long ago. Uh, I remember, you know, there's lots of PR agencies and they want to charge a lot of money to let's say, get you in a magazine or do this kind of thing. And I thought about it and then I thought, you know what? Uh, I'm going to just try to do it myself. (laughs) Like, I don't, I don't care. So I reached out to the editor of entrepreneur and I was like, Hey, here's my idea. I'd like to pitch to you. And he was like, Oh, you know what? Uh, I see you're a writer. Hey, why don't you write the article even better than I get full control (laughs) over what is said and how I'm presented. And then they published, it was all like within seven days. Now I could have paid six grand for that. <laughs> um, and again, not to say that someone shouldn't, but I did, I just thought, and then I, and there was a moment of like, oh, well, is that how things are done? Will they think that was weird that I directly contact them versus having some sort of PR per, and I thought, no, fuck, like who cares? And it worked. And that's really the story of a lot of my life is never hurts to ask. But a lot of people just, again, they're, they're thinking they need someone to help them or they're too afraid to pick up that phone or just reach out. Um, and there's a lot of issues with that. And I think that's the biggest stumbling block for people in business is self-esteem and confidence. So let's talk about how maybe you think you can work on that if you're lacking in that arena, or maybe some examples from business where, you know, you've seen people overcome it or where there were hard moments for you, but you did it anyway. So I know that's a t- lot. <laughs> no, 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 I, I get it. I get it hundred percent. So I'll give you a, a quick story around being afraid of that phone or hating that phone. So I used to, when I was a sports agent, I used to work out of my house and I'd have to call the parents. And every morning when I would wake up, I would, you know, block out about two hours of cold calling. And I would literally walk down the stairs and sit at the top of the stairs and look at, we used to have those rotary phones back then, or those, you know, those, those big, big phones sitting on your desk, oh, yeah. not cell phones. We didn't have those. So I, was, I would sit at the top of the stairs and literally stare at that phone for maybe 10 minutes and, and get myself psyched up to get on that phone. So you've got to develop little tips and little tricks on, on to get yourself excited about making that call or walking up to that person or saying hello or whatever it is. You've got to get excited to do it because if you don't, you said it earlier, if you don't go get it, ain't nobody in the world is going to give it to you. Like nobody's handing you anything. I'm sorry, especially now with inflation through the roof. Like nobody's giving you anything. Everybody's taking, taking, taking. So you have to go get it. Um, and, and so, you know, if you look at in the book, I cover 
10 external conditions and 10 internal conditions and everything you do gets your mind prepared for for the day everything that i uh, speak about gets your mind prepared for the day gets your body prepared for the day and and gets you you know helps with your confidence overall so again getting back to nutrition if you're if you're loading yourself up with sugar there's probably a pretty good chance that you're going to be sleepy all day long. Probably a pretty good chance that your, your confidence levels are low because you're definitely, you know, again, don't have to be a supermodel, but your body has to function properly in my mind for you to have confidence, for you to be, you know, energetic all day long, for you to be fired up all day long. It's also another trick for you or a tip is your, your crew or the people you hang around with. So if you're hanging around with people that are negative, if people, People that have no confidence of people that are like, well, I don't know, I'll do it tomorrow. What do you think you're going to be like? But if your circle of influence is people that are go-getters and people that are aggressive and people that are hungry, what do you think you're going to be like? So that's almost yeah, the motivated first. and inspired to do the same. Absolutely. To that. Yeah. So imagine if I hung out with L Russ every single day, I would be a beast. You know what I mean? So. <laughs> You'd be already on to your next company. Yeah. There, there, there it is. No, no, so, no. It's true. And I mean, that's what I talk about in my second book as well. People have heard me talk about it before, but it's the downer effect. Stop hanging out with downers and stop being a fucking downer about other people's stuff. Stop thinking these downer thoughts and turning them around because we don't want to also chump in on any other people's confidence as well. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, so L, I'm going to take a guess and say that you don't listen to mainstream media. That's just a guess. Is that you, right? Well, or no, I take it back. Well, no, I, I do. I kind of check in on all of the stuff. I do. I take a look at all of it. Okay. So, but you, I'm sure you discard the negative stuff that, uh, that, that oh, yes, yes, yes. And I, I try, usually I don't, I try not to like watch local news and things like that that are just reporting murders. Um, yeah. The yeah. biggest thing that I would say is for anyone healing or trying to even get confident or be in a good vibration and get happy is to like, how many, I know so many people that have trouble sleeping. And then I'm like, well, what are you watching at night? And, and, you know, it's like a law and order rerun. I'm like, there's murders and rapes happen. Like, what are you going to bed with this shit in your mind? Like, what are you filling your mind with? So I tell everybody, get rid of the Beverly housewives, bullshit, chicks fighting with each other content, start watching comedy, start laughing start watching documentaries, things that are filling your mind with interest and perhaps wonder and curiosity. And you have to filter that out. And I know a lot of people that will be like, well, I just watch the reality shows. Like, it doesn't make me feel bad. I'm like laughing at their lives. I'm like, no, nah, it's seeping in. You got people fighting with each other and being catty. It's seeping in. You're watching people solve murders. It's going to seep into your subconscious. I agree hundred percent. And uh, here's another trick around that. So for me, after eight o'clock, if I if I look at any blue light like a television or a computer yeah. screen or a cell phone, it's going to affect my sleep. So I, I turn my cell phone to red light. So you can do that in, in iOS. I don't know how to do that in Android, but you can literally. So I put it on red light and it does not impair your sleep. It doesn't hurt your sleep. So that's another tip. I talk about that also. Yeah, blue, blue, light, uh, blue light blockers as well. Um, I interviewed many years ago, James Swanick. He created Swannies, which are one pair of glasses you can wear to block blue light at, in the evening. And of course, I'm all for red light therapy. I'll give a shout out to Juve. I love their products. There you go. Um, yeah, so do I. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, Juve's great. So, and this is something that I do like about you about, there's so many people that pride themselves on like, I only need five, six hours sleep. I'm like, good luck. You're going to burn out at some point. <laughs> we'll see on the flip side. I prioritize sleep like nothing else in my life. It is, it is absolutely imperative to my life. If I get less than what I want, I'm, I'm, don't talk to me. You know what I mean? It's not a good day. I agree with you hundred percent. So I need between seven to eight is what I need. So, you know, if you read any, you know, probably read your books, you're saying that, you know, women need, uh, sorry, men need between six and eight and women need between seven and eight. And maybe you can explain to me why physically a woman needs more sleep than men, or, or is that even true? Tell me that. I don't know if it's even true. I'd have to look into that. Um, all I could say was that perhaps we're more sensitively hormonally structured than you guys. So that it is imperative for rest and that, but, uh, you know, we're dealing with three different hormones that are at certain levels where your guys are just kind of dealing with one main one. So that could be part of it. Um, I don't know if it's true or not, but I definitely, yeah, I'm a seven to nine hour. And if it's there less than seven, I'm kind of off, but I think people need to start prioritizing this. Every time I ask somebody, no one's trying. It's like, they keep going. I know I'm getting a better. I know I need to, I know. And then they keep complaining about being tired. At what point are you just going to call bullshit on yourself and start to prioritize the sleep? I've also noticed 
I mean, I'm sure you, this is sort of a circadian rhythm thing, but when you're on a regular schedule and you're not using, you know, working the night shift or whatever, there is like a, if you kind of pass that 10, 30, 11 threshold, there's a resurge of cortisol there. And then, Absolutely. and then you're kind of effed. So with my friends that have had trouble sleeping, that then now have success with it, they have to like set an alarm on their iPhone that tells them at like 10 30 or 10 to start preparing to go to bed before 11, you know, that kind of thing. And it works. Absolutely. And, and I heard at a, uh, I was at a seminar, I think it was Sivananda, a yoga seminar where, where they were talking about that any hours before midnight are actually worth double. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's stuck in my mind. And, uh, and it seems to work, like you say. So if you get to bed, let's say 1030 and you're waking up at six or seven, uh, you know, you're much, you feel much better than let's say you went to bed at midnight or one o'clock and you're waking up at seven or eight. So, so, uh, you've already aged yourself on this podcast. So, but, so you've lived, some life. <laughs> so you've lived some life. Now we're at the point where we're talking about writing a book on mindset and all this type of stuff. What are things about your life, characteristics, qualities that you had that you didn't like that you had to take stock of and go, I need to change that. What were some things about you? Like for me, I'll say that, you know, being an alpha female, it was really tough to kind of embrace vulnerability there for a while. That was one of my things I had to really kind of overcome. And there were some other things that were just, you know, small things that I was like, Ooh, I, I need to operate differently. One of the ways I've mentioned this before is um, because I'm so I'm from downtown Chicago, I'm very direct. And uh, a lot of people aren't like that. And so they can sense directness as being aggressive or mean or take it in a certain way. So I've had to learn to preface myself over time with certain personalities where I might need to open up a conversation with some more fluff before getting down to business. Whereas I'm sure that if I called you, I should be like, yo, Mark, what's up? Okay, let's get to it. What are we doing with this thing? And no one's offended. You're like, probably like, yeah, good. Thanks. No small talk. Let's go because that's our personality, but that's not everybody. Right. So I've had to adjust. And I really still sometimes come across that where I'm like, uh, or I need to flower up an email better. Cause you know, no one sees that kind of direct getting down to business as a, they, they see it as negative. Right. So what are some things about you that are like that, that you got, Ooh, I, got I, think, I think you just described me to a T by the way. <laughs> I don't think I related to somehow. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, one of them was, um, so I, I did a, a retreat, uh, Sivananda retreat, which is a 10 day meditation retreat. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. Um, um, come on. Not Sivananda. Yoga. Uh, Vipassana. Sorry. Oh, Vipassana is a, it's a 10 day silent meditation retreat. And what it really does in the effect that it had on me. So prior to going to this retreat, I'd be explosive. Like, so for example, if a sales guy would come into my office and complain about something, I'd rip him a new one. Or if the sales were down or I'd walk out on the sales floor and explode. And so I, I'd call it, you know, wearing your emotions on your sleeve. But after going to this uh, retreat, what it basically does is it takes, takes out all the toxic energies and all the toxins from your, 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 your muscular system. So for example, if you're growing up, Ellen, your father told you you were a piece of shit, right? That's going to be housed somewhere in your body. Your body produced chemicals or cortisols and you didn't get rid of them. They're still in your body. So what Vipassana does is it literally helps you take move energy through the body and take uh take those 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 bad chemicals out and that tremendously helped me with my explosiveness or my you know my uh my ability to control my anger unbelievable so people call me you know pre-meditation mark and post-meditation mark (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so aside from, I'm sure taking a moment before speaking, your tone is way different in the way that you handle the criticism that you're delivering. Yeah. Far different, far different. Or you just and- take a moment and wait to yell. Is that the only thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I have a, a longer fuse. Let's put it that way. And also to your point on writing those emails, I used to write direct and cutting emails. Whereas now I'll, I'll, I'll soften them up and, and, you know, fluff them up. And, you know, it's also, look, it helps helps um, positive language or positive reinforcement it helps people. Uh, I'm, it helps you in the fact that people, you know, respect you more, like you more rather than you just ripping people all the time. So, you know, that that's a huge turning point in my life. What's uh, you've witnessed a lot, not only within your own companies, but probably elsewhere in business. What's one of the things that stands out to you as a, me- a memorable, like colossal business fail? doesn't matter if it's something like they made a bad investment or it could just be like they were poor, poor managed, you know, they were terrible at managing people, whatever it was. What are some things that come to mind where like, oh man, this was a doozy? Well, in my life, I've had several failures, but the biggest colossal failure and the, the way the book starts is my, um, 
my epic failure in real estate back in 2000. I invested in a project in 2007. And maybe you remember those years, 2007, Mm -hmm. 2008. Um, And I, but it wasn't so much the investment I made. It was the fact that I was a puppy dog to this, to the, 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 I'll call my business partner at the time. And it was incredible how much I, uh, and that was a turning point, you know, professionally and also personally, but it was incredible how much I, I ate, how much crap I ate and how much BS I listened to and took. And, you know, your colossal failures are typically your turning points in life. And so anyway, the project ends up going upside down. I lost, I was on the verge of bankruptcy, anxiety, depression, blah, blah, blah. But then when you flip that switch and you hit that rock bottom, you know, a lot of things changed in my life, my leadership style, my skills, my, my ability to detect bullshit, my ability to, you know, understand people through and through. So psychologically, I grew big time. So that was a huge turning point. What's one of the best moves, most brilliant moves you've seen, whether it's within your own work or what you've witnessed in someone else's company? Well, in, inside my own work, I mean, when I hit rock bottom, I was literally probably a few thousand dollars away from zero. Um, I had an opportunity. I picked up the phone and I told an ex-colleague, I'm like, look, this situation, I'm, I'm dead broke. I, I, I need help. I got to do something. He's like, well, you might be in luck. I've a buddy of mine just they just did a deal with the, at the time I was living in Canada, they just did a deal with the biggest Canadian bank to run their portfolio and they need a guy like you to run it. And so I had zero confidence, but, you know, two weeks later, I'm in their offices pitching, you know, the, the, the sales pitch of my life. And I got the deal. I got 30% equity in the company for a really little bit of money, which I didn't have at the time. And I had to creatively raise it, but uh, that was, that was, so I guess the learning is when you're rock bottom, if you reach down deep, you can pull off a win no matter what. I love it. What are some other thoughts you want to share with our audience about stacking the odds in our favor and, and becoming lucky? Well, look, um, especially right now, I don't know if you saw the, the Federal Reserve came out with their, um, you know, their <laughs> number on inflation. So they said it's 7%. It's not. It's way more than that, really. But the official number is 7%. So that means that let's say you don't have assets, you don't have real estate, you don't have stocks, you don't have cryptocurrencies, you don't have things like that, you're behind the eight ball, right? So you've got to quickly understand how the market works and understand what's really going on and what inflation is. So number one, financial stress is the worst stress. So if you can understand that and you can start putting money into assets, into hard assets that are going to, inf- that are going to inflate along with inflation, then you're going to get that, that mental stress out of your system. And then number two, once you've got the, the, sorry, not mental stress, the financial stress, which is the worst stress, Al. I mean, I've been there a couple of times. I don't know about you, but if you can successfully get rid of that financial stress, then you could take the next step and fix your sleep and then fix your, you know, the people you hang around with and fix your food and fix your language. So I, I got to say that it starts with you having a, a, a foundation or at least a, a foundation with finance and understanding finance, I think. Let me ask you this because, okay, there's a lot of really smart, successful people out there that have proven success. And then there's also a lot of smart, successful people on that same level that are on the opposite team of what I'm about to propose, which is, do you really think that NFT, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency is really the next? There's so many people that are like, this is like get in on NFTs because, you know, this is like the internet back in 1995. You don't want to miss out on it, blah, blah, blah. And then there's these other people that are also at high levels that are going, this is a bunch of crap and it's BS. What are your thoughts about this world? Well, my thoughts are back in 2000 or 1999 when Google and Microsoft, not Google, Google and Amazon were out. You know, I I said exactly what you're saying right now. I thought it was BS. I didn't think you know Google and Amazon were. So I had an opportunity to invest in Google and Amazon at that time. Right now, it'd probably be worth you know a billion dollars had I done it. So I'm not going to miss this time. Is the point? So if you take two, three, five, 10, 20 percent of your portfolio, is it really going to matter to you if it doesn't work out? But I'll tell you this: I'm a believer that you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and some of the other cryptocurrencies are the foundation of the financial system. I'm a, I'm a believer that, you know, Bitcoin is, could replace gold as a, a store of value. Where else are you going to put your money if you think about it? 
right? Where else are you going to put your, there's only a few places, real estate, there's a stock market, and then there's cryptocurrencies. So why not diversify at least some of it into crypto, which, which could be the foundation of the, of the future, which I think it's going to be. Fascinating. Anything else we'd like to, you know, end with or any kind of tips or tricks or things you'd like to share with our audience on this topic? Yeah, first, I'd like to um, give, the, give the audience an opportunity to find out how lucky they really are. So I've, I've put together a quiz called the Lucky Quiz. So you can find it at um, theluckyformula.com slash quiz. Again, that's theluckyformula.com slash quiz. And it asks you 20 questions and it scores your luck score on a, on a scale from zero to 100. And L, I took I'm, it you know, and I, got, oh, I took it. Did. I got a 93% on it. I was going to say, I bet you're in the 90s. I was gonna, <laughs> so, that's cool. So look, it, it just, it gives you an idea of what your luck score is. And then if, if it's lower on the scale, it gives you an idea of how do you, how can you increase your luck? How can you increase your success? And, you know, it, it is a formula in my view. Luck is a formula. Success is a formula. And it's all about stacking and stacking things in your favor. So I can give you one last story, which I think you'll love uh, being a woman entrepreneur. So I was at uh, Dave Asprey, who you probably know, Dave Asprey's event in September in Orlando. And so I'm sitting in the, uh, at the VIP lunch and a woman sits next to me and her name was Kim. So we started talking. I said, what do you do? And Kim was like, well, I'm the, I'm the president of the Buffalo Sabres. And I was like, whoa, that's cool. A woman as president of a hockey team. That's amazing. I've never, yeah, I've never seen that before. So we start talking about some of the players and, and, you know, then I look at her name tag and her name's Kim Pagula. I'm like, that's cool. You're not only the president of the Buffalo Sabres, you own the Buffalo Bills and the Buffalo Sabres. So, you know, we had, we had a pretty good chat, but the point was I wasn't afraid to talk to her and and, and, and ask her what her problems were with the Buffalo Bills and marketing. And so her, uh, the issue they were having, not the issue, but yeah, it's kind of the issue. The issue is that their demographic is 50 year old white males, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I proposed to her, I said, okay, I have an idea for you. My, I've got 70% of my company is Gen Z and we've got over 200 creators that create TikTok ads all day long. So I literally called my team and I said, Hey, I need 10 ads right now, you know, get them over to me. So I was able to give them over to her and, and potentially we're going to get the Buffalo bills as a, as a client, because I showed her how we could, we could advertise, you know, and, and attract Gen Z to, to uh, something that's focused, you know, to, to a sport that's focused on, you know, older demographic. So anyway, the point is get out there, get to events, talk to people and don't be afraid. And, and you're going to get lucky. You're going to get, I call it uh, every event I go to, I get lucky. Right. So that, that's just one example of potentially if we, we might get lucky on that one. I love it. Well, thank you so much for your work. Everyone can go to marklachance.com and the that's book right. website is theluckyformula.com. And that's where you can find the quiz, which is theluckyformula.com forward slash quiz. Thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate the conversation and all of the work that you're doing. Uh, Elle, thank you for having me. It was an awesome chat. Everyone else. We'll see you next time. Hey listeners, you know, over the years, a ton of companies have approached me to collaborate, but I will only promote companies whose products I believe in and that I actually use and consume on a regular basis. So let me tell you about some of my favorite companies that I can offer you discounts for. Rep Provisions, an amazing company doing incredible things for our planet, topsoil, and animals with regenerative agriculture. And it's my number one source for quality pasture-raised meat and chicken. Visit repprovisions.com and use code L15 for 15% off. I'm also obsessed with a company called Carnivore Crisps. They make a lean, all-natural, and delicious alternative to conventional snacking made with just real meat and real salt totally addictive and my favorite ones are the beef brisket and the ribeye visit carnivorecrisps.com and use code paleo10 for 10 percent off i also love and regularly use paleo valley products they make amazing supplements and delicious paleo products i use the superfood greens powder grass-fed beef sticks the organ complex and their bone broth bars i love the lemon and apple i also use their essential c complex and more Visit paleovalley.com forward slash promos forward slash L Russ for 15% off. 
I also love Primal Kitchen. They make delicious paleo-approved, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and no refined sugar products. And I use them daily, from their collagen powders and sauces and marinades to their avocado and olive oil. So good, so healthy. Visit primalkitchen.com and use code L10 for 10% off. I also love paleo powder and use it almost on everything I cook. They make incredible seasoning blends and they also have these incredible grain-free coatings that feel just like crispy breadings that you would have had prior to knowing that there's another way. So visit paleopowder.com and use code L15 for 15% off. 